Good deal. Oh, every time a person preaches, they get the uh, the feedback from some people uh, during the message that what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> Sometimes you get the feedback after the sermon. The Lord really blessed me through what you shared today. So first service felt a little bit like the first thing I shared, but. <laughs> Thank goodness that the second part of the service came afterwards. So, yeah. I'm excited because it's the 29th of August. And uh, there's just been something that's been burning in my heart since I took the class two or three years ago. Uh, It matters a great deal. Uh, It's incredibly confusing. Um, It's like the viruses and the colds and all those things that we get. You just don't see it. But it really, really causes problems. So if you've ever found yourself striving to get it right so that you can make yourself clean enough, presentable enough, beautiful enough, holy enough for God, you've probably fallen into this belief system that I'm going to talk about today. If you found yourself waking up somewhere some morning, let's be honest, uh, some afternoon, I've done that before, and your thoughts are, God loves me so much, it's all grace, 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 grace. You know, I can do whatever the H I want because God loves me. If you fall into that category, you're probably falling into this false belief that I'm talking about as well. Uh, It's something that we see and we know, oh, that's a Greek word. Oh, okay, that Greek word is knowledge, and that word is gnosis. And from that comes Gnosticism. And we're all familiar with Plato, or most of us are, you know, the Platonic idea that I'm sitting in a chair and I'm watching this thing play out before me, and it's really a projection of something behind me. And the object of my life is to become aware of what that is. Now I'm aware, I'm awake, I know what reality is, and then I make my way out of the cave. Maybe you've heard of that, maybe you haven't. Google is a great thing. (laughs) Plato, the cave. Enter. That's for after the service. But the point of that is self-awareness, transcendence. I'm becoming awake. If you've watched any of the movies that have been really popular in the last 10 years from this studio that didn't really exist before then, Marvel Studios, you've watched Bruce Banner, you've watched Tony Stark, you've watched Peter Parker. I have to throw Sony in there a little bit. They've all been on this track of reckoning with their superpowers and, and this sudden awareness of this knowledge they have that they're special and they're here to save the world. And as the 10 years have gone by and the, and the story has played out in the Marvel Universe, suddenly there's this realization that there are other universes out there and there's other realms of reality and all of this weird stuff and time travel and and that plays into Gnosticism. Actually, Gnosticism is right behind all of that. It's, it's clear as day. A uh, movie that the church latched on to back in 1999, um, I'd actually gone back to school, and one of the RAs, the resident assistant in the dorm I was living in, just fought with the leadership, not fought, but really argued his case because he wanted to use that movie as the theme for his floor. And that movie was The Matrix. Uh, It was really known for its cool special effects. Nobody had ever put cameras all the way around a wall before and then put them all together so people could jump up in the air and then they would just put each film, you know, there in front of us and it looked like they're just spinning. But it's cool Hollywood magic. But the hero of that movie, Neo, that's the name he goes by. He thinks he's a cool hacker living in some, you know, seedy kind of city somewhere. And one day he gets a message on his computer. Neo, wake up. 
If you've watched The Matrix, you know where that ends. And if you haven't, uh, if you can stomach it, watch it, because Amy hates science fiction. <laughs> uh, but she loves me. So, um, but Neo is this guy who thinks he's living in one reality, and people really wake him up to the actual reality that, that is in existence. And it's just really horrible in comparison to what he thinks. But he goes on this journey of self-discovery, and he realizes that he's the one. And does a lot of cool jujitsu and kung fu and all kinds of weird stuff and jumps in the air and flies because he finally realizes, I am the one. I have, I have arrived. And that's really just a really cool, fancy way of preaching Gnosticism. And there are two more movies after that. They're making a fourth now, and I'm, I'm going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know why I'm holding this. Um, there's a guy by the name of Derek Morphew. Uh, he has his PhD, so he's really smart. He's the leading theologian in the vineyard for a lot of years. He's the guy who's responsible for the academic setting up of Vineyard Institute, which used to be Vineyard Leadership Institute, which was... So anyway, this guy's really smart. He knows his stuff. And he taught a class on Gnosticism. And that became a soapbox of mine after taking that class. Because it's everywhere we look, and we never see it. Everything that we believe in the church is affected by it, um, in one way or the other. In fact, he, he writes in his book that Gnosticism is this boiling pot, so you can think about, well, what's that movie, Clash of the Titans, or really any movie where there's a witch stirring a pot. He says, Gnosticism is this pot of these deadly poisons. Some of them are almost harmless. He says, but they mix together, and they taste really good. And the people who drink from that get hooked on it. And they think that they're actually drinking from the milk of the Word. The Gospel of John was almost not included. Some people really fought against it being included in the Bible. Because they said it's a Gnostic Gospel. Because he uses the words light a lot. He talks about the truth a lot. He talks about being set free. And he uses a lot of Gnostic language. And people were like, this is Gnosticism, get it out of here. And sometimes when you're going against something, you have to call it what it is. And in order to bring the truth, you have to point out the obvious lies. And thankfully, people figured that out, and the Holy Spirit won over. So the Gospel of John's included. But a lot of his writings, 1 John, uh, especially the Gospel of John, they were in, in written in part to refute Gnosticism, which Gnosticism as we know it today didn't really come about until like a hundred or so years after Jesus, when Plato and all of his buddies, like I said earlier, uh, they, really, they really defined what Gnosticism is. And it's, it's a convoluted belief system. Uh, I tried to go through it in first service and, like I shared earlier, it just went... <laughs> but thank goodness that the Holy Spirit uses whatever comes out of our mouths because I've been in so many sermons where people walk up afterwards and say, when you said X, Y, Z, it blessed me so much. And I said, I never said X, Y, Z. <laughs> so God is faithful. God is faithful. And he will bring about what he wants brought about. Bless you. It's good to see you here, Sean. I like you. Um, so Gnosticism, like everything else, has to have a beginning point. And that beginning point came about along the same time as Jesus was born, right in that, that whole era. Because you had all these Gnostic, I mean, not just Gnostic, all these Coptic beliefs from Egypt. You had all these Eastern mystic religions of self-discovery and journeys. You know, Hinduism, things like that come from that. But Gnosticism, even though it was older, it's kind of like Jesus said about Abraham. Even though Gnosticism is younger, it was actually before 
because what we call Gnosticism is actually something else entirely. So I lost my place. It'll come back to me. Um, oh, yeah. And then, yeah, so these mystic religions, these Coptic beliefs, and then you had Greek mythology on top of that. And Roman mythology, you know, partnered with that. And then you had Rome with its thumb on Israel. And then you had that little ragtag bunch of people, the nation of Israel, who for thousands of years have just been fighting their way, stumbling their way. You know, sometimes when they could have fallen, they chose to dive instead. Um, that's a song lyric that I'll tell you guys later. But they all end up in the same place. All of these belief systems come together, including Christianity and Judaism. So there's this idea of something outside of my own knowledge, something outside of my own reality that somehow I need to find out. Well, Christianity, and Judaism even for that matter, is a story of God saying, here it is, here's the book, wide open. In fact, I'm going to come and I'm going to live with you so I can show you what this is about. Okay, you flopped like fish out of water for too long. I'm going to come and I'm actually going to be in you so that you know. It's not something that we have to seek out, search out, find the special knowledge, find that person who's more spiritual than I am. Or find that person who's less spiritual than I am so I can go teach them. (laughs) God is an open book. Gnosticism is entirely about secrecy. Long story short, Gnosticism started out with this really bizarre thing, and that's what I'll call it, that became aware of itself. And I don't know how you can, maybe it was daydreaming, I don't know. But it became aware, and it started pondering on what it was. Oh, my gosh. And in that pondering, um, those thoughts took form, and like the amoeba that we see, and you guys remember those from biology class? Yeah, I'm sorry to bring biology back up. But you have this amoeba that's just kind of here, and then suddenly, bloop, something oozes out of it. It's an amoeba, but it's a different amoeba, and then bloop, bloop. So Gnosticism is like that. We'll call it an amoeba, and it just blooped a bunch of lesser amoeba. Or think of it as a waterfall. You have a stream, and then it just cascades down, different levels. And salmon will find that really fun because they get to jump back up, which is also part of Gnosticism. Because the object of Gnosticism is for me as a human being to transcend my reality and to help as many of you transcend your reality as I can so that I can make my way back up the stream uh, or maybe the amoeba thing goes crazy because I'm hopping from amoeba to (laughs) that's more like Donkey Kong but to make my way back to that original thing that started thinking about itself and when I get there the, the transcendence, the light that I have inside me gets to go back to its original home. And so in the, in the Gnostic mindset, we actually make God better, more whole, than when that first amoeba thing popped out. It's, like Derek Morphew says, it's humanism, and it's, I don't think the word he used was blatant, but I'll use that one. It's just straight-up humanism. We are the center, we are all of that, and a bag of chips. And if it wasn't for us, God would be left floating around somewhere, missing all of his light. Yeah, all of his blurps. Because in Gnostic thought, when that first blurp happened, all the light that was in that divine being exploded all over the universe. And after that cascade of waterfalls, just like any movies you've seen about cloning, you know, there's always something a little bit less with each clone. This final state of that original being, and this is science fiction-y stuff, so if you like Star Trek and 
Star Wars, you're probably digging this. <laughs> and the converse is true. But that final thing that exists, that popped out of all these, like the last amoeba, we'll call it, just didn't have really any of the traits of the beginning. Uh, Gnosticism has some pretty strong words for it. Uh, we might say it was developmentally disabled. Uh, we might go back 20 or 30 years, you might use some of the more derogatory ter terms for it. But needless to say, it thought it was doing a good job because it created everything that exists physically. All this material stuff, the skin, this earth. And it was proud of itself. It thought it was doing a really good job. But in Gnostic belief, the spirit is good. The flesh, the material, the physical is evil. Because this idiot thing created everything that exists. And if you haven't made the connection yet, in Gnosticism, this thing, it has a name called the Demiurge. Come over to Judaism or Christianity, you see the name Yahweh. And in Gnosticism, Yahweh and the Demiurge are the same thing. So in Gnostic belief, Yahweh is a complete idiot because he created everything that exists. And it was this giant mistake. And it's our job to correct his mistake and make everything right again. So what does any of that have to do with anything? <laughs> when I am told that the stuff spiritually about me is all that matters, and my physical stuff doesn't matter, then it's easy for me to say, well, you know, one day I won't have to deal with this crap anymore. And that translates into Christianese as, some glad morning, I'll fly away. It's not just in our worship songs today. It's in our hymns hundreds of years ago. It's always this idea of I have to escape this physical reality because it's horrible, it's torturous, it's evil, it's wrong. And that comes into the church like gangbusters. In fact, Derek Morphew says that where is the one place on earth that Gnosticism is most likely to be found? He says it's anywhere where people are longing for or experiencing true spirituality. He says it's the Achilles heel. Do you guys know who Achilles is and what an Achilles heel is? Yeah, it means that's like the weak spot. But Gnosticism is the Achilles heel of the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements. And we've all sat in judgment watching our TV of that televangelist or that prophetic person who just isn't quite all that they seem to be. Uh, we've all been experiencing these places where like that pastor or, or that leader, that spiritual guru to, to mix religions is really kind of in a place where their sexual behavior doesn't really match up, but they're so, their personality is so charismatic. They're so amazing to be around, and God really uses them because they speak true words when they prophesy, when they come with words of knowledge. In fact, all of those things, words of knowledge, prophecy, healing, those things are all really just revelation of God. God knows your heart. He knows your heart. He says, Daniel, this is her heart. I know her. And he gives Daniel that word of knowledge that you didn't think anyone knew about, and it sets you free. Because God cares. He wants us to be free. The problem that we run into, especially in the charismatic and the Pentecostal movements, is that that word of knowledge, that experience, becomes the thing we crave. Oh, I want that. And God says, I've got that and so much more right here in my hands. Um, you guys sing about loving my presence, but you really just want my credit card. <laughs> if we're parents, we know what that's like. <laughs> but the good news is, is that the gospel is true. 
And there were people like John. There were people like Paul. Part of Colossians um, addresses it. Uh, Revelation chapter 13 especially addresses Gnosticism. So what does that mean for us as a church? Um, it means we need to be careful. It means that the, the move of God is real, it is true, but we need to be careful that we don't take in the bathwater with a baby to flip that one on its head. It makes sense in my mind. So scripture tells us to discern each spirit, to test every spirit. You guys familiar with that passage? Yeah. yeah. That's a big part of it. Because I can be super duper spiritual guy out here, just doing all kinds of cool stuff. But if there's nobody around me to rein me in, there's something wrong. There's so much more to go into that. Um, Paul was writing to, was actually talking to the church in Ephesus. And Luke wrote these down. He, he recounted what happened in the book of Acts, in chapter 20, uh, verse 29 through 31. Paul's getting ready to leave Ephesus, headed towards his destiny. He says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men and women will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, with tears. This really mattered to Paul. He was getting ready to leave. He's the guy we read the read his letters, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, and Paul gets in there in some places, he's just the most gentle, loving man there he is. And then there's sometimes he's just punching people in the face spiritually. You should not be doing this. He's warning us to be careful. Um, as I pat myself on my phone <laughs> in Scripture, he's warning us, be careful. Is the stuff of God, it's real. He says, I, I speak in tongues more than any of you guys. You think you're spiritual to the Corinthian church. You got nothing on me, Paul says. He's not afraid of the supernatural. There's a parable that Jesus taught or spoke, and it says, There is this owner who sows field, seed in his field. And when he's done, he goes home. And he goes to bed. And at night, an enemy comes and sows his seeds. When the supernatural starts happening in a church, we'll go with some correlations here. God is planting his seeds. Seeds are starting to grow. Um, God's been planting or tealing and, and, and plowing the land of this church for 40 years. He's been getting it ready. Seed has been produced. He's planted more seed. More seeds are coming. But the enemy has come and planted his seeds also. So I really want to just kind of bring Gnosticism into your view a little bit, put it on your radar. Um, we'll be having a class in September that will actually go into this in a lot more depth. So if you're not turned completely off by the end of this <laughs> message, you know, uh, sign up and you can e email me, clint at cambryvineyard.org. You can call the office. Uh, you can send a carrier pigeon. Um, but we'll be talking about this because the, the rabbit hole, Alice, is really, really deep and weird. Um, some things that we can be watching out for has already been spoken about in the Bible. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said it was good. About two chapters later, whatever time frame that might be, some people eat some fruit, do what they're not supposed to do, and sin enters. And it says, because of what you did, the land is cursed. 
He didn't say it's bad. He said it's cursed. Flip forward a little while, and he says a guy, hey, go to this land, I'll show you. Abram says, okay. His name's Abraham now. He's the father of the faith, of actually many faiths. A um, couple, anyway. So God says, I'm going to fix this. The ground's cursed. Everything's cursed because of what you did, but I'm going to fix it. And he tells Israel, hey, I'm going to fix this this way. This Messiah is going to come. Jesus is born. Jesus lives. Jesus preaches. Jesus works miracles. Jesus dies. He's dead for three days. In a grave, he's there. On the third day, what happened? He rose. He rose. Yeah, I'll give you a hint, guys. It's why we celebrate Easter. <laughs> he, was in, he was in the grave for three days. Some people came. They looked in the grave. He's not there. What does that mean? Just think of this in really basic terms. If you go look for somebody and they're not there, what part of them is not there specifically? The body. There's no body. There's no body. So what that means, Gnosticism, because remember, physical material is evil, spiritual is good. Jesus didn't float up out of his body and now he's a super cool spirit. Ooh. You know, he came in, he ate fish. Hey guys, how's it going? And then he walked out a wall. So something's different. But it's his body. We end up uh, hearing a lot of times when we really feel good about somebody, we're starting to feel kind of uh, emotional or what's the word, nostalgic or whatever. I I can't think of the word right now. But so-and-so in heaven, they're an angel now. How many of us have heard that? Yeah. How many of us believe that? And you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. You believe it? That's okay. Um, The Bible doesn't say that at all. We do not become angels. That's Gnosticism. The Bible says God's intention for us is that we become more and more like who? Jesus. Jesus, His Son. Glory to glory. So we're in this wrecked physical body with my appendix gone for 30 years or more, you know, with a meniscus gone, with an ankle that hurts right now even. And I'm like, ah. Physically, I want to really agree with Gnosticism. I can't wait to get out of this body. How many of us have woken up in the mornings and been like, oh, I can't wait to get out of this body? (laughs) Well, I'm sorry to disappoint everyone here and everyone listening. You're stuck with your body for all eternity. And that's good news. Because Jesus' body is not in the grave anymore. Jesus is in his glorified body. And it says, when he comes, when he comes, we will be like who? Him. Because then we will know, even as now we are fully known. Gnosticism is a really fancy Greek way of saying, yes. So Gnosticism is escapism? Yeah, I would say I would say escapism is comes from Gnosticism. So yeah, the question was, is Gnosticism escapism? I say I say they make a really good marriage partner. So good good thinking. Um in Gnosticism the physical is evil, the spiritual is good. And so especially with us charismatic types who want to have words of knowledge for people and prophetic words for people, and we want to heal people, and we want to see the move of God, right? It's easy for us to get caught up in those other seeds that are planted that say this move of God is really, I've got the corner on that market because I've been reading my Bible more than you have. I'm praying more than you. I spend more quiet time than you do. And God is showing me things. And now I'm going to impart my knowledge onto you. And that's not how it is. 
God does give us teachers. He gives us preachers. He gives us prophets. He gives us evangelists. He still gives apostles. And just, you know, so nobody freaks out. Not the 12. Okay? Apostles is just a Greek word that means sent out or called out or the best word that you could probably use would be like church planter or missionary. Because they have a little bit of all of the giftings. And they can go somewhere for a short time and work in all of the areas of giftings until the prophets come along. until the, And then they're like, okay, awesome. You guys are set. I'm off. And if you don't believe that's true, go read about Paul, who was an apostle. And what did he do? Planted churches. He went on missionary journeys. He's like, you guys are good. I'm taking off. I'm going over here now. So, the apostolic, the apostle word, all of that is like super fiery, and we can't, we can't talk about that in church. So, we'll save that for another time, okay? Just, just know that God does have offices, and he does call people to those offices, because we do need to be trained. We do need to be taught. The gospel does need to be preached. But when we get into this idea, like Sean was saying, of escapism, of I have to get out of here. I have to get out of this country. I have to leave this world. I have to go to a better place. We're, we're starting to turn the car into the stream of Gnosticism. Jesus said, this world's got a lot going on, but don't worry about it because I've overcome the world. And does that mean... Here's the cross, and I'm on my way, but you know what? I don't want to do it. I can escape before I get there. Jesus says, no, here's how you do it. And he walks toward it, and he dies on it. And he says, guess what, guys? It stinks. (laughs) But look at me now. So Gnosticism is just kind of this thing I want to bring on your radar, like I've already said. It's this idea that I have secret knowledge, like you've heard before. It's this idea that I can have more spirituality than another person. Um, And quite honestly, that just can happen because I read my Bible and this person next to me just doesn't. It's not because I'm more spiritual. So those things happen naturally. That's where I was getting to go. Thank you. Yeah. So Denise said, what is an invitation away from Gnosticism? Um, But before I get there, what I was going to say is um, ways you can know that you're probably entering into Gnosticism or into Gnostic thought. Um, And again, I want to remind you guys, did I do that this, this service about walking on the paths in Cambria? No. 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 Thank you. There's that phrase, don't go looking for a demon under every rock. Okay? You guys familiar with that? Okay. Well, it's a, it's a phrase. I don't know who said it. But basically it means don't go looking for things that aren't there. Um, to use something that we understand a little better here in Cambria, we can go walking on any of these paths around, okay? But we don't have to stay home in fear because... Whatever path I go on, there's going to be a mountain lion, right? What's important is to know that the mountain lions are out there somewhere, and I probably won't encounter one. But if I do, I need to know what to do. And that's more of what this class coming up will be like. But if you find yourself um, thinking that I've been praying a lot and God has told me, that this is the direction for the church, and it's my job to go tell the pastor where he's wrong, you're probably in, in the Gnostic camp. If you think those people in church are a bunch of idiots, and I don't need them because I really know what's going on, so I'm staying home because I'm better off by myself. I learn more that way. Probably you're entering into Gnosticism. And you've probably, knowing the church, 
because I'm part of it. You've probably been injured by the church as well. So it's a combination of things. But if you think that you have more spiritual insight than other people, be careful. Uh, If you think, I cannot wait to get out of this place because it is so horrible, uh, be careful. If you think, I play a major role in the kingdom of God, and because of that, God is going to be better off, be careful. (laughs) God is fully capable of doing everything he wants perfectly. He's shown us time and again we're the ones who are not that way. So, Some things we can do is what you guys are doing right now, what you guys online are doing right now. Stay connected to a body of believers. Because when I start getting the spiritual words that are just through the roof and over the moon, you guys can draw me back to earth. Be like, I don't know about that, Clint. That sounds a little wacky. (laughs) And the Bible says, test all spirits, many false teachers have gone out. That passage is about Gnosticism, by the way. So don't seek knowledge. Don't seek special knowledge. Be careful, because the Bible is an open book. God has revealed himself completely. He laid himself bare on a cross. This is who I am, guys. Look in the grave now. What do you not see there, guys? My body. Guess what? I still have my body. It's glorified. And one day, you're going to be like me. Yeah. Yeah. The arthritis will be gone. Finally. Not just healed, and then it comes back. Because guess what? This is a spoiler alert, everyone. (laughs) All of the people who were healed in the Bible that we read about, the guy that got his sight back, the guy that was healed by the pool of Bethesda, guess what? They're all dead. <laughs> well, dead, dead-ish, you know, apart from the body, you know. But later on, their bodies will be called up and glorified, all that stuff, theology, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's what I wanted to, to just talk about today is, is that because I, I'm really passionate about it. Um, because we all are blind because we really want to see the things we want to see. And we want to think that we see them better than everyone else because we're all steeped in shame and fear and discouragement. And to mask that, we come across as being proud and arrogant, intelligent, So just stay connected with your body. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. You can pray. You can journal. You can do all these other things. That's wonderful, and it's good, and it's what we're supposed to be doing as well. Because we can look back years later and say, this is what happened. But read your Bible. Get in a small group. If you're not in a small group, that's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, And if you're in a small group that, I want to be careful, uh, because some small groups can be open, anybody can come, some small groups are closed, like no one's invited, they each have their place, they're each good, but just like the, the Red Sea and the Dead Sea, if things don't continue to come in and go out, it becomes the Dead Sea, because things go in but never leave. Anyway, I'm rambling at this point. So, um, yeah, I I really want to do some prayer time now because I know that God has spoken to some people. Uh, Regardless of what I sounded like or regardless of the words I said, I know that God has has said some things to people. Um, I just want to point out two other things that 
uh, sprout directly off of the stump of Gnosticism. And I've said it again. Uh, but if you find yourself striving to make yourself better, to do right, to discipline yourself, if you're striving for that, get in a small group, get in, get in a body of believers, talk to one of us pastors. Because that comes straight out of Gnosticism. I have to make myself better. Which means I don't need Jesus. Yeah. Yes, Rick. You can... uh, yes, I think you're raising your hand, are you? Genesis 3 error that is I'm going to use my own judgment yep and it is not the remedy or cure for this looking at the wonder and complexity of creation itself you throw out creation and go to the immat only to the immaterial, to the spiritual, you throw out the reality. You also throw out what God has created. So this is really saying, I know better myself. Mm -hmm. I don't have to believe what has been given to us scripturally. And that's the core of the human paradox. Mm -hmm. Because I see, I hear, I think, I'm creative. I can throw out God's creation. Mm -hmm. That's the Gnostic approach. It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And speaking of creation, because Second Peter says this world's going to burn up in fire, it's going to be destroyed by fire, right? I can't wait till Peter just, or till God destroys this world with fire, right? That same word for destroyed by fire is the same word that's used and destroyed by a flood. God destroyed the earth with a flood. Where are we standing today? The exact same planet. This is a second shot. The exact same planet. So yeah, keep playing. You can play louder. I love that. Um, we're standing on the same planet. And so when Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new, he doesn't say, Behold, I make all new things. The physical body that was buried in a grave is the physical body that spoke to John the Apostle. Is the, is the physical voice that said, Behold, I make all things new. This earth and everything that's been done to it and everything we've done to it, it's going to be renewed. It's going to be renewed. Behold, I make all things new. So our bodies are going to be made new. This world is going to be made new. Our relationships are going to be made new. Our relationship with God is going to be made new. And a spoiler, another word for made new is redeemed. So I think that some of us here have really been living in a place of despair. Uh, escapism, as, as Sean pointed out. We've given up on God. We've given up on creation We've just had enough. We've watched TV. we listened to the news. We're done. We're done. I'm here to tell you this morning there's hope. Rejoice. There's hope. Say again. Rejoice in tribulation. Rejoice in tribulation, yeah. That's James's half-brother. I mean, Jesus' half-brother said that. He knows. So I'm going to invite whoever would like to pray. Did you have something? Okay. Would you like to pray? Sure. Sure, okay. 
Jesse will be up here to pray. Frank, would you come up? Frank will be up here to pray. Sean, would you come up and pray? Okay. You guys come on up. Uh, yes, Becky wants to say something. say that the world could see a difference in us and I want you to believe that um, we can be caught up in the world and we can be worried and I think when we're worried and we're concerned about what's going on and not that we don't grieve when we see some of the things that have happened in just the last couple of weeks mm -hmm. there is a difference in 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 who we are and what we look like and I only say this to encourage you I went to the thrift store on Friday to look for a pair of shoes for my grandson because he's in orchestra and his mom doesn't want to pay $45 for a pair of shoes, she'd rather pay five. And so she sent me to the thrift shop to find a man's pair of shoes. And I was sort of discouraged because I couldn't find anything. He needs a black dress shoe. You know, not a shoe that he'll ever wear again except for these two concerts that he's going to be playing in. And so I was just, I was actually down on the floor, which was really hard for me because it's hard for me to get it up when I'm down. But a lady said to me, um, what do you think of this wig? Do you think it, do you think it looks good on me? Uh, do you think I can make this work? And, and of course, what do I say? I say, well, I think it looks really cute on you. I think it would be a great, you know, different look. And that was all I said. And she went to pursue it, what, how much it cost and if she could buy it. So she talked with Paula, who was working that day. Mm -hmm. And um, I went about, and I was going to leave. And uh, Denise found, uh, not Denise, but Jackie found me a pair of shoes that worked perfect. So I went back in. And I can just be really chatty. So I'm chatting to the lady who's buying a couple cushions for her, her father to go in his wheelchair. And then she's getting some little decorations. And oh, I said, oh, they're so cute. I don't know what this lady who asked about the wig, and she was told it wasn't for sale, so I felt really bad. I wanted to buy her a wig, because I know she wanted one. And um, <clears throat> anyway, as I was going out, then I Thank Jackie for her help, for finding these great shoes. They didn't even look like they had been worn before. Um, and they were a little bit stylish, I thought, for black shoes. But the long story short is this lady came out, and she walked over to Jackie and I, and she said, do you ladies go to the Vineyard Church? And, and we both said, yes. And she, could, she said, I could tell by your faces just the light in your face. So I want to encourage you that we can be a light to the world. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who are struggling with what's going on in the world. People are just, they're crushed. They don't know what tomorrow will bring. You know, if we listen to the news, we're afraid to go to San Francisco or or L.A. because we might get <clears throat> bombed, I mean, or we might get murdered. You know, there's just so much fear in the world. Right. But we can be a light mm -hmm. by just being friendly mm -hmm. and helping people out. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, you know, we yeah. don't want to get pulled into false teaching. But, you know, when we know the truth, mm -hmm. it's reflected in us. Mm -hmm. And people know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good word. Yeah, Jesus said you're the light of the world. Somebody didn't discover that. I think to plant just to pray a blessing um, yourself or one of us. Yeah. I just feel like God wants to release more light and revelation that is truth. Mm -hmm. um, and that, yes, we need to be aware. We don't need to live in fear. Um, but um, I just, let me just do that right now. So, Holy Spirit, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you that your word of truth lives within us. And Lord, would you continue to pour your spirit out and where there are lies, where there's falsities, Lord, that they would just fall to the ground mm -hmm. and they would dissipate because in mm -hmm. you is light and there is no darkness. Mm -hmm. And that when your light comes, it dispels all darkness. So I just mm -hmm. bless you with the light of Christ that is in you, that you'd have eyes to see and your faces would reflect that light. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Yeah. Amy, if you could come up and pray also, because you've received some healing. If you have time, if you have to go, God's okay with that too. If you would like prayer today for anything that's been shared, um, one second, Gretchen. Go ahead. front of us. All we have to do is pursue him. And that there's, even if the world can be filled with so much suffering and so much pain, God put us here because he wanted us here. Yes. It's not some trial, some tribulation that God wanted us to feel some pain, something that we didn't want. He wanted us to be here because he wanted us. Amen. He didn't need us. He wanted us. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Amen. Amen. So if you would like prayer, come on up. There will be people who here who will pray. Uh, I've already put you on the spot, so feel free to put me back on the spot by not coming up. But if you'd like prayer, come on up. Otherwise, I want to let you guys go because it's a warm day. We're going to sing another song, but go in the knowledge and the peace of Jesus Christ today. That he is, that he was, and that he always will be. Amen.